Okay, so take, take a couple of minutes, uh, buzz groups, the person next to you, front or behind. How could this possibly happen? A company that had the technology before anyone else in their industry, how could it go from hero to zero? So based on your knowledge or based on your best guess or based on your intuition, what do you think happened to this company? How could it fall so far so fast? Uh, we talk about internal and external. Externally, it could be disruptive, new disruptive technology. Just make the existing uh, paper film um, uh, technology irrelevant. Just like the DVD, just like the record. It doesn't matter, you still, there still might be R&D continuous going on in those areas, but digital age comes in, this becomes irrelevant. Internally, I mean, Kodak, I think, uh, it made its it glory days was on the uh, film and the traditional camera. And once you become really good and really big, uh, you build all your core competencies around it. It's like a beautiful Titanic, it's gigantic. But once you see the uh, threats, uh, even though you realize it, it's too little, too late. It's hard to, unless you really focus, gather all the momentum, momentum and resources, it's very hard to turn a direction. And I think they sort of, the sad thing about it is they sort of see that, but it just, they, they couldn't do much about it. So it's, it's, it's a very good point that uh, Emily's making. They can see the future. It's not like they're blind to what's happening. But they, they have an organization that's not well equipped to succeed, to compete in this, in this new business. If you're Kodak, what do you do with 3,000 chemical engineers? What do you do with them? They're on long-term contracts. What do you do with factories with 25-year leases on equipment? What do you do with it all, all that? You know, a startup doesn't have that legacy to, to, to worry about. So there's tough decisions to make about what to do with your current business, for sure. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah, it comes, it feels on the other point, but they were afraid of destroying what they had. So it's quite hard for a company to say, this is wrong, we have to go that way. And I think they underestimated the potential or the powerful of, or how, how fast would the change be. So it was just too big and they probably ignored it. Mm. The change wasn't actually that fast. I mean, I got my first digital camera in 1994, and it was like brick. But still, I mean, the, uh, Kodak wasn't delisted until 2012. So it did happen fairly quickly, and there was a tipping point when it happened extremely quickly. But they should have had the time. Yeah? I think it's also sort of a, an arrogance, because if you have a brand name, everybody knows about it, uh, you, uh, you're sort of the market leader, you are not, uh, you don't have any motivation to change. I mean, you're on the top, what change if you're on the top? Mm. So that might have been also the... Mm -hmm. And in fact, they were, they were successful. They were profitable up until 2003, 2004. They're still making money. Uh, they're, they're meeting their numbers. The executives are getting their bonuses. The time, when is the time to make the radical shift? Before the end, right? <laughs> Before there's nothing left. But that, that's the time when things are going great and nobody really wants to change. Yeah? Uh, Kodak also had a notorious history of actually missing the trends uh, in the past as well, because in the 60s and 70s they uh, had like 80% market share in the US market, but they were very fast uh, challenged by the Japanese companies <coughs> very quickly and they lost the sitting position. Uh, so they, couldn't, they didn't probably learn fast enough uh, with this new change coming up. Is that because they're stupid? No, maybe not. It's hard. It's hard. It's not easy. Even knowing it is not enough. Uh, so why is it that some of the world's greatest, most innovative firms have struggled? And many of them failed. Do you think it's because they didn't see the future coming? No. Are you going you gonna to answer? <laughs> Go ahead. I think these companies, they are giants. And uh, it's difficult when you're a giant to, to, to move uh, into new fields, so mm. to, to innovate and mm. to, to catch. Mm. Mm. There's a great quote in the, in the, in the Nespresso case, mm -hmm. uh, something like, uh, organizations are designed to kill innovation or, mm. or s something to that effect, <coughs> big, big companies. Uh, this is the guy who invented the digital camera. He did it when he was working for Kodak. Were they poorly managed, these organizations? Typically, no. 
until maybe the very end, where it's too late. You know, they're, they're, they're succeeding in, in, in the businesses they're operating until it gets too late. Uh, were they doomed to failure? Were they doomed to failure? No, because not all companies fail. In declining industries, not every company fails. Uh, were they organized to fail? Of course, this is a pedagogical uh, trick. <laughs> I put the last question there because I think the answer is yes. Okay? Uh, so, why? Now, here's where we get to a little bit of uh, uh, theory um, around, around innovation. Let's say performance on the, um, uh, the y-axis and time on the, on the x-axis. Let's say you come up with uh, an innovation, put it out on the market. Probably what's going to happen? Who said that? Yes, many innovations failing. Sure, it's going to fail. Most innovations fail, at least the first time. But let's say that doesn't happen to you. Let's say you get lucky. And you have a dip, but it starts to take off. And you've got a success on your hands. You're growing, your performance is increasing, it looks great. Then what happens? Then what happens? Yeah. Sure. The competition is not going not to look at you and think, oh, those guys are so smart. I'll just let them have that, that market. No. They're going to come in and they're going to try and uh, compete with you, right? And then when, when, the, when the competition comes in, the game changes. You still go up, but it's, it's not quite the same uh, steepness. It was like this. And when there's a lot of competition, then you have to uh, think about cost, economies of scale. So you build bigger factories. You set up processes. You put in Six Sigma and Lean to try and drive the waste out of it. You hire people who are, who are, who are process-oriented. And it starts to dip because it's less profitable. And eventually, like everything, it finishes. Do you know what we call this? Product life cycle, what else? The hint is in the, the way it looks. S-curve. Call it the, uh, the S-curve. There's S-curves for products. There's S-curves for, for uh, companies. There's S-curves for industries. There's an S-curve for your life, I suppose. <laughs> pretty, much, <laughs> pretty much everything can be put, uh, can be put on an S-curve. So here, you have, um, it's, a, it's a good place to be a few competitors. <coughs> Compet here you have many competitors. What type of innovation is down here? Radical. Radical innovation. It's something new. You're creating your own space. What type of innovation is up here? Disruptive is down here. Incremental. Okay. The name of the game up here is to create slightly improved, slightly cheaper products or services, processes, to try and stay competitive against a lot of um, pressure from competitors. Do you understand? Is it clear? Okay. So you have different types of innovation here. You have radical innovation. You're creating a new market. Here you have incremental innovation. So here's the difficulty if you're an organization like Kodak or something else. You go into a new market. You're radically innovating. As you move up the S-curve, the game changes. So your competencies, your resources, your people, your systems become focused on incremental innovation. The problem is when you get here. Why? Because you've lost the ability, you've lost the capability to radically innovate. Not because you're stupid, but because you've followed a legitimate um, reaction to the life cycle of the, 
of the industry or the, or the product or the company. Did you have a question? I'm not sure there are a few competitors when you're talking about radical innovation. There are lots of competitors, but all of them are soft and they try to find a good path. And lots of them will die in the, in, in the few first years. So I think there is a lot of competition, but in a growing, fast growing market. Probably. There's cer certainly a more openness to operate there, a lot more freedom, a lot more flexibility to operate because you don't have established competitors there. They, they see your success and then they come in. They come in around here. So the problem is when you're sitting on the edge there, looking down, you got a, you're not so happy, you got a little hat on there. You're looking down and what do you see? You see darkness. In fact, you don't see darkness. What you actually see is lots of opportunities. And what happens to those, most of those opportunities? They fail. So it's not easy. What you really want to do, of course, is jump onto the next S-curve. But it's extremely difficult to do because it's not always clear what that next S-curve is. So you'd make a jump. Kodak jumped into printers. So their, their view was, OK, we're going to turn the, the um, Nespresso uh, razor blade model on its head. We're going we're gonna to charge a lot for the printer, and we're going to sell the ink for cheap. That was their, that was their approach. A good approach? Apparently not. It didn't work out very well for them. So you want to be able to jump the S. It's exactly what we call it, jumping the S curve. Like, looks like, like this. OK? So that's the challenge for organizations that jump the S curve. And it's extremely difficult to do. Once you see the uh, threats, uh, even though you realize it, it's too little, too late. It's hard to, unless you really focus, gather all the momentum, momentum and resources, it's very hard to turn a direction. And I think they sort of, the sad thing about it is they sort of see that, but it just, they, they couldn't do much about it. So it's, it's, it's a very good point that uh, Emily's making. They can see the future. It's not like they're blind. Okay, so take, take a couple of minutes, uh, buzz groups, the person next to you, front or behind. How could this possibly happen? A company that had the technology before anyone else in their industry, how could it go from hero to zero? So, to what's happening. But they, they have an organization that's not well equipped to succeed, to compete in this, in this new business. If you're Kodak, what do you do with three thousand chemical engineers. What do you do with them? They're on long-term contracts. What do you do with factories with 25-year leases on equipment? So based on your knowledge or based on your best guess or based on your intuition, what do you think happened to this company? How could it fall so far so fast? Uh, we talk about internal and external. Externally, it could be disruptive, new disruptive technology. Just make the existing uh, paper film uh, technology is irrelevant, just like the DVD, just like the record. It doesn't matter, you still, there still might be R&D continuous going on in those areas, but digital age comes in, it becomes irrelevant. Internally, I mean, Kodak, I think, uh, it made its it glory days was on the uh, film and the traditional camera. And once you become really good and really big, uh, you build all your core competencies around it. It's like a beautiful Titanic, it's gigantic. 